Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You and I both grew up as kids of Indian immigrants who love to debate, super confident, perhaps overconfident in our views. But here's the difference. I kind of know my limits. You, on the other hand, having never held or even run for any elected office before, be it Congress or even school board, having not voted in three presidential elections in a row, suddenly now want to be president, go straight for the top job on planet Earth. Your critics would say that's the epitome of tech bro arrogance. What is your response to them? I get that you're an outsider. Personally, I like outsiders. Yeah. But what have you done that even qualifies you to be president of the United States? So look, Mehdi, I have been taking on bureaucracies my entire life. I took on the bureaucracy of big pharma starting in my late 20s at a time when I think pharma was corrupt and going in a lot of directions that they shouldn't have been. I actually built a multi-billion dollar business developing medicines that pharma had abandoned. I took on the ESG bureaucracy, competing with firms like BlackRock, State Street and Vanguard to build a successful firm called Strive. Yes, none of that is in government. But it is in the private sector. It involves taking on bureaucracies. Okay. And that exactly is my mission here, is taking on the biggest bureaucracy of all, that in the federal government in Washington, D.C. And the other thing I'll, get, I'll add to that, Mehdi, is it's not just the outsider pitch. I think we do need an outsider. I think it's good to have a business background. But I'm also an outsider who deeply understands the law and the Constitution in this country. And I think that's the unique combination that actually makes this my calling. And I hope that we're going to be successful in reviving this country. So you talk about your business background. Let's talk about that. You made your name and made a lot of your early big sure. money from pushing an Alzheimer's drug that had already failed four clinical trials when you bought it. You then talked it up on CNBC and Forbes on the cover. Your company subsidiary shot up by billions in value when it went public in 2015. But then the drug failed its phase three trial on your watch. The company lost 75 percent yeah. of its value in a single day. Ordinary investors like the California State Teachers Pension Fund lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you cashed out beforehand via your parent company to the tune of, I believe, over $37 yeah. million. Your critics say it's a classic pump and dump scheme. What do you say to them? Yeah, Mehdi, that's the standard opposition research during politics reading line. Anybody in the biotech industry knows this story very well. 99.7% of Alzheimer's drugs have failed. That's thousands of drugs. Mine was one of them. But the company I founded, Royvent, developed a range of medicines. And the way I made my money was not through the failure of that Alzheimer's drug. This is one of the pieces of misinformation from opposition research. I could have sold shares in that subsidiary Alzheimer's company, but didn't. So the person who was hurt by that was me. Hold on, hold on. But you say this a lot, but did you succeed. did sell shares yep. in Royvent, and you made $37 yeah, million. Is dollars. A, and Medi, $37 million. Medi, I think That's you owe it to your, small your audience. Mehdi, I think, I, think you, I think you owe it to your audience to be accurate. That is shares in a different company, not Axivant. And those shares company. that I sold are worth and those yeah, exactly. And those shares are worth dramatically more today. So I would have made more money had I held on to those shares. So don't believe what the opposition research pervades it's not, through it's the not media. Opposition research. The fact we looked at the tax is, returns, which well, you very is, kindly have released. Yeah, exactly. And you made, you which made, you I made voluntarily three... released. You because did, I want you to be you transparent. Made, you made 300 grand in 2014 on capital gains. In 2015, after the IPO of this uh, Axovan, you made $37 million in capital gains. Yet others didn't make after that kind Royvent, of money. After Medi, Medi, give me a break. After Royvent, the multi-billion dollar business that, I, that developed 40 plus medicines, yes, I sold shares in that. And that business, if I may actually allow you to know how I made my money, developed Five FDA approved therapies that are now FDA approved today. After you sold one the of them is a life saving therapy FDA in kids. When you were CEO, Another were one. They? they were FDA. Actually, over the time that I developed them, we took them all the way through phase three, and then we but did a three FDA billion approved. dollar deal they were, that they actually were approved a year and a half later after you sold the company. Yes, yeah, so, so Mehdi, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to fault you for not knowing the first thing about biotech because that's not your job. But getting through phase three is the final stage of clinical testing before yeah. you hand in the application. Yes, my company did a three billion dollar deal that actually did make money for those shareholders. And so, yes, I have built Royvin's a publicly traded company, nearly ten billion dollar public company today that I yeah. built as the sole founder from scratch as one Do of several regret? companies that I've built. So, yes, I have a business record you, that I'm proud you, of and will equip me to lead this country. You mentioned three trials. The Alzheimer's drug failed it. Yes. You much did a lot of touting of it. You say 99.7% failed. You never said that at the time. Do you have yes. any regrets about how you hyped that drug? I Your did CEO say that. Of, CEO of Royvin said this week that you hyped the drug. Do you regret hyping it? 
We did not hype the drug. To the contrary, actually, one That's of the things the that one of the things that I found this week. Well, I can't speak for I can't speak for what is or is. I haven't read any article that you're quoting, so I, I don't exactly know what you're referring to. The fact of the matter is, though, I have been transparent at every step of the way. Everyone who is in the biotech industry knows that Alzheimer's disease is the graveyard for medicines. But I still think it's an important area of need. And I'll say this, Medi, is, you know what? If I serve for two terms, I'm still going to be in my 40s when I leave the White House. It is a personal passion of mine to come back and see if Alzheimer's disease hasn't been cured. I do want to play a role in still delivering treatments okay. and cures for that disease. And people who don't so, take risks, don't achieve meaningful impact. The medicines that I did develop, I'm proud of. And you don't get there without having a number of medicines that you test along the way. And the other thing I will okay. say is our success rate under my watch was higher than Probably nearly 99.9% of biotech startups in the last decade. So, yeah, I stand you, by that record. I'm not afraid well, of taking risks. Well, That's part of the well, American spirit. Well, technically, and I stand the successes it. were a year and a half after you sold the company, but we can, we'll get bogged down. Let's talk politics. Medi, that's, that's, that's dead wrong. And I, I would sorry to say you're embarrassing yourself in front of anybody who knows anything about biotech it's factually for true knowing that phase three trials are the final stage. Okay. The final Fine, stage, I've, I've, the FDA, I've the phase three myself. studies succeeded. Got so you're, you're barking up the wrong tree, but, but we can continue about, to move let's on. Let's talk politics. Let's talk politics. We do. We want to talk lots of stuff. Sure. You're an advocate, your critics say, of fantasy politics, of magical thinking. They say you propose stuff that can't be done. For example, you said on Meet the Press the other week that if you had been in Mike Pence's place on January the 6th, you would have insisted on first passing a bill that night to bring in single day voting on election day. With that's, paper incorrect. Ballots, that's inaccurate. Government I issued never ID. said that night. I never Just said that. Now, you what you would have done again, on January the 6th. I, and you said I would have done this. And I the said next what day I would have done got... differently is that I was precise about the period between. And this is still ambitious, I will admit. But at least let's get my view correct. It is ambitious. Between November 4th and January 6th, you I think it was an anything opportunity about for heroism. I mean, just to be clear, you never said anything about absolutely have said it every step. Let's, let's play the clip. Guys, do I've we said, have the clip? I've, I've said this in clip. countless forums. Let's, let's, let's have a listen to the clip. Uh, right. I, on, the, on, the, on your Chuck Todd splice script, in, in, in all of my written statements and everything I've said, Hold on, we've we're said playing the clip right in now. that period let's play the clip. between the election, here's what I would have said. We need single-day voting on election day. We need paper ballots, and we need government-issued ID matching the voter file. And if we achieve that, then we have achieved victory, and we should not have any further complaint about election integrity. So, what would, so what I would, would have you driven have done, through the Senate. So what would you have done as, with Mike Pence? You would have so not my capacity, certified the election? So in, in my capacity as president of the Senate, I would have led through that level of reform, then on that condition certified the election results, served it up to the president, yeah. President Trump then to sign that into law, and on January 7th declared the re-election campaign pursuant to a free and fair election. Vivek, not only do you not mention anything about November, but let's say yeah. you did do November. That joint session was yes, not a legislative that's still session. Ambitious. That's the still vice ambitious. president doesn't have the power to introduce legislation. Neither party would have backed such a bill. Oh, come and on, it couldn't have been passed in a day. <laughs> the You're fact just of the matter is, naive stuff. The that president. The president and vice president absolutely drive legislation through Congress. That is exactly okay, how but things Trump work. Trump wasn't doing legislation. Now, he was busy view, pushing the big lie, as you pointed out yourself in your book. Well, you, so he wasn't and there. And I wasn't Mike the vice Pence president of the United States. Passed a bill, but, but <laughs> and I was not the vice president of the United States. You, were Mike Pence, you guys in the media, you, you guys, you guys in the MSNBC, crack me up to sort of create a hypothetical situation to say, if you had been vice president, what would you have been doing? I'm With telling you exactly what I've been, been doing, but you're saying, but that's what Donald Trump was doing. This is like. Joke. Pence asked you, let's hold on, actually Vivek, hold have on. a substantive conversation. Uh, do you on. want to have a substantive conversation hold about what, we were, what should have happened? I, or I do you want to play a game of gotcha? Because yes. you have a choice. I, the I choice is yours. You do you actually want to have a substantive conversation? If you do, I'm down to do it. Can, can, <laughs> do you want a substantive conversation? In? What we need. You is, said substantive full time. Actually, if you want to get a word in, you know, if you're going to speak the truth and ask a legitimate question, have at it. I think it is a legitimate question. Multiple people wondered about your knowledge of how Congress works, suggesting Mike Pence, by the way, on the debate stage, asked you if you would have supported what he did. It's not an MSNBC question. It's a Republican vice president question. Yes. So fine. You don't want to answer it. You think you could have passed it. It was a missed opportunity for heroism, not in one day, but I think that in a period of two months. And I think you're a smart guy. You understand this. There's an American confidence guy. You I know it, it couldn't have been done in I two think months. It, I think, 
under extraordinary circumstances in extraordinary times, okay. we have an American Confidence in Elections Act. It's literally making its way through Congress now. ACE, I support it. I think yeah. if we had gotten that done during that window, further we said it, single day voting, yeah, Democrats on election wouldn't day, have agreed as a to national voting holiday, ID, and Mitch with, McConnell wouldn't have agreed to a well, national holiday. I think holiday, Democrats but we can, should agree to it. We can argue forever. I think, we can argue forever I think about Democrats that. should agree to it. That's a different and that's argument. What I, stand it for. I, I think we're still going to get that done when I'm the president. Okay. When so I'm you the president, recently, so not you in some fantasy of, land you, where I was vice president in, in some so other year in the let's historical let's history. Let's talk about you as but president. Actual, what I'm running for Understood. is what we're going to do. Let me ask a question so we don't run out of time. Please don't fill us. I just want to ask a question about Please. when you're president, you say you want, you said this is your yes. words, quote, if you want to stay out of no win wars and make America stronger at home, I know how to get that done. Genuine question, yes. Vivek, not a gotcha. How? How do you know how to get that done? With respect, yes. you've literally never done anything like that in your life. I could go out on the street, outside the studio, grab someone. They have as much experience as you do of keeping us out of foreign wars. That's not an insult. That's just a statement of fact. No, it's not an insult. It's a fact, right? And it is also a fact that everybody else who does have experience in the foreign policy establishment has been sending us into no-win wars for a long time. Both of those are facts. Here's how I would do it. Let's get specific. And I'm glad we finally got into the doorstep of actually discussing an, a policy agenda. Here's what I would do. Pull Russia apart in its military alliance with China. Those two countries are in a military treaty dating back to 2001. That is the single greatest threat that the United States faces. So I would end the Ukraine war on terms that, yes, allow Ukraine to at least come out with its sovereignty intact, which may not even be the track they're on right now, but in return and also make a commitment that NATO will not admit Ukraine to NATO in conjunction. And by the way, for yeah. people in the foreign policy establishment, they forgot that Gorbachev was made that promise by James Baker in the United States in 1990. Well. So keep our word there. But in return actually make a hard requirement that Vladimir Putin yes. exit his military alliance I've with heard China you say this many and times. remove his Russian military presence from the West. That's and the deal that I would again, do. Again, the fantasy land is why would Putin just interests. agree with you? Why? Because you asked nicely, Putin will hold his word. He'll pocket your concessions no. and not just carry on dealing with his biggest trading partner, China. Well, here's the thing. I actually think that China shouldn't be his biggest trading partner. I think it's a mistake that we've closed off economic relations with Russia. I would lead both okay. the United States and the West to reopen economic relations with Russia because Putin okay. does not enjoy being Xi Jinping's little brother. Mehdi, you're a smart guy. Look at what he's done. He's actually sent weapons to both India and Vietnam and right after we, the February 2022 meeting he had with Xi Jinping. There are cracks in that armor. But we, will we need have to, to actually open our eyes to see the opportunity staring us in the face. We will have to agree to disagree whether, whether we think that you can persuade Vladimir Putin to drop his alliance with Xi Jinping. You have made truth the centerpiece of your campaign. So let's talk about your trustworthiness. Yes. For example, when CNN quoted you talking to The Atlantic about 9-11 and federal agents possibly being on the planes, you said the quote is wrong, actually. But the quote wasn't wrong. The Atlantic released the audio yes. of what you saying exactly what well, they said you said. Hold on, hold on, let, let me, me finish the question. Let, let me, me finish be the question. crystal clear. Let me finish the question. And the Atlantic the whole tape. They refused to do it. Yep. You said Sounds on Twitter good. spaces last month, that no, you would never supported Bernie Sanders' mass fraud legislation, but you literally put out a tweet in July of 2020 calling it a sensible idea. You also said not once but twice in June and July that the first time you'd ever voted was in 2020 for Trump, but in fact the first time you voted for president was in 2004 for a pro-choice libertarian candidate. How can people believe what you say? So, Mehdi, let me just go through one by one. The Atlantic Yes, purposefully spliced an out of context quote where we have challenged them. They released the tapes. We asked them for the tapes first. They didn't give them to us. They waited then to splice them and release them publicly. I challenged the Atlantic to release that entire conversation. And what was but a the conversation quote about Caitlin how many federal Collins agents were in the you, field? You on, said was wrong. We all yes, heard so, it. We so, can play it if you like. No, it, I, I, it is exactly so word many, for word what she day, quoted to you. You said so they look, put words I, in your look, mouth. Look, if, if you want. It, if you want hard facts, here are hard facts. That day, The Atlantic printed it. I said, that looks like something that never captured the character of our conversation. Can you ask Atlantic for the tapes? They said they would refuse to release the recording to us. So when Caitlin asked me about it, I said, that does not at all sound like the context of what I said. And then, you know, it turns out The Atlantic <laughs> releases the a very... is wrong, actually. To it. A You're finally, putting words in my mouth. It, it you could have said, sends the wrong message, you could have said, Oh, functionally. Okay. You it could was have said badly, it's out of context. It was, you it said was the so badly was taken wrong. out of context that it misled their audience. It was so sure badly was. taken out of context. It was okay. basically a lie and it misled their audience. But ask the it's Atlantic to release it. So my view here is... The lie is denying you said words that we all heard filters. 
Mehdi, if they are going to cut something before and after without the question of what the guy is that came beforehand, come on, why okay. wouldn't the Atlantic? Why are they so reluctant to release the whole recording? Maybe ask because the audio the they released, you're still denying you said what's something. on the audio. <laughs> okay, let's ask you this question. The is audio, Donald Trump, it, it's a as joke you say that now, the media is going to selectively the, edit this, is, and this is the way is this Donald game is played. Trump, Politics is dirty, it, it, that's okay, I'm ready for it. It's not just to be clear. Is Donald Trump, as you say now, the it was best absolutely president of the 21st century? Of the 21st century. Yes, he was. Question is, let me finish the question. Is Donald Trump, as you say now, the best president of the 21st century, who you say you want as an advisor and a mentor if you become president? Or yes. is Trump, as you've said in the past in your books on Twitter, a quote, sore loser who is a quote, danger to democracy and who did quote, downright abhorrent and egregious things on January the 6th? Which one is he, Vivek? So, to be crystal clear, between George Bush, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Donald Trump, those are the presidents of the 21st century. Donald Trump is unambiguously, as judged by the results, the best president of the 21st century. Kept us out of wars, grew the economy. I give him full credit for that. I want to build on that foundation and take this country but to the next level. But you've also called him a sore loser mean I would have who is made, a danger to democracy. Would I have, those are strong words. I w- would I have made the same judgments that he has made at every step of the way? No, I will remind you that I am running well, for U.S. president you because you're I am also, best very vague about this. to lead this country forward. Can I ask forward. you what they are, Vivek? Yes. You say he behaved in downright abhorrent behavior that makes him a danger to democracy. Yes. What was it so, that was downright? Let's, Tell let's me what be, he did that was downright let's abhorrent. A, let's actually be... Let's actually be really fair to your audience. So on January 10th, 2021, thereabouts, days after that incident, I wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal arguing that censorship was the real cause of what happened on January 6th. Which when asked true, in response, yeah. somebody asked me the question, are you that that's that's well, that's what I wrote. I'm giving you the facts okay. of what I said. That's a hard Understood. fact that was published in The Wall Street Journal when pressed on. Was that condoning what Trump did? My answer was no. There is a difference between a bad judgment and Understood. a crime. And, and we you're need to be my able question. to tell the what difference in this country. What did Donald Trump do, no, I'm not in your, your view, that was downright abhorrent? Second time I, I asked think that, that the thing that I would have done differently if I were in his shoes not what I asked, is Vivek, I would have respect. declared re-election on that's January 7th. I'll ask that, it a third that's time. exactly the thing what I would have done. What did Trump do that was egregious, quote, downright abhorrent and a danger to democracy? Can you just explain to our viewers your words? So, 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 so you're, you're mixing two different quotes. But what did I think was reprehensible about what happened that day? Look, I think that the way a true leader should have handled that situation should have been to actually say, this is me running for re-election, yep. not actually litigating what is already passed in behind us. And I would have done things differently. That is not a crime, though, I, what I, he I did. I understand. And because, the reason but, I have been but, so vehement. You keep saying no, what you would have done. I just want to hear from your mouth. No, no. I would unless not, you're scared of him, yeah. why won't you maybe, say what maybe, he did that was maybe, downright I'm not gonna, abhorrent? I'm not going to let you... St- Stitch, okay, you know, you're stitching quote. together Let's, three things from three different Let's places. Put up the tweet. To Let's put up the tweet. Picture. Do you want what to, Trump did do you last want to week have an wrong. actual conversation? Yes, I want you to answer my question, Vivek. Three Medi, times I've asked it. That what is did a Trump repl- do and, and, that was and, downright abhorrent? It's a yes. simple question. It's your words. It's on screen. I think what did he fact, do that was downright I abhorrent? Think, I believe that failing to unite this country falls short of what a true leader ought to do. That is why I'm in this race, is to do things differently than any prior president has done them. That's the hard truth, okay? And that's what now made the him a sore is loser and a bargain, yes, your word. And the, well, the reality is none of that is a really? crime. And the reason it. I have been so vocal, okay. the reason I have been so vocal is because when somebody actually prosecutes somebody for a bad judgment, and I've been I, clear, I, I understand he made your bad judgments, to the litigation. I would have made I different that. judgments. And that's not that what I asked him. That is a distinction we have to draw. Understood. You say you are anti-identity politics, yeah. anti-affirmative action in a party that hates the Soros name, yet you accepted a Paul and Daisy Soros scholarship at law school, law school that was specifically set up for the children of immigrants. It was an affirmative action scholarship. And your defense for that is that you didn't have the money to pay for law school, even though you'd already made over a million dollars true. at the time and made my, another my two million dollars. Is, my defense of that you is somebody gives you a money. merit scholarship at the age of 24, you no, take you it. Told at the age of 24, you somebody gives you a merit scholarship, you take it. I didn't say I didn't have the money. I said at a time when I had a lot less money than now, $50,000 no, was exactly still I didn't have the money to make. make. You keep forgetting your quote. You said, when yeah, I didn't well, have the money. So, so, Mehdi, I've made this really easy for everybody. And I did this yeah. in the early weeks of the campaign. Yeah. I released 20 years of tax returns. Yes, you Something did. that no presidential candidate, let alone somebody who's successful in business, has done. I challenged yes, Democrats and Republicans alike, and, uh, and including the Biden them. family, to do it. 
And we and, looked and at you them. Know what? I, re- I released it so that you could look at them, so we can have Thank an honest so conversation. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. The funny thing I, I learned, do appreciate that. It's yes, something Trump and, should and I think that transparency you. is important. But look, so it's, here's, here's two, so it's we already have open and everybody can and see it. Exactly. We have 2009 But the fact of the matter is, you know what I would advise every... Hold on, you Every told me to look at them. I'm looking at them. Take $50, 2009 yep. and 2010, you made seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You had the money to pay for law school. You didn't need a Soros affirmative action scholarship that you now yeah, criticize. I mean, if, none of this is worthy. But if you think it is, let's get to the detail. That was well, actually I, I, the first big piece of money. You say you're anti-affirmative action. Was, well, you took a scholarship for immigrants. I'm anti-affirmative and their children. action. So why did you take a scholarship so which, for the children of immigrants? Would, which falsehood would you like me to address? The financial one or the or the one about my views on affirmative did, action? Because I can go in whichever not, order you like. Did you not make seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Financial piece of it. Not at, not at the time that I had applied for the scholarship yes, you did. that fall. Yes, you did. That December. Yes, you did. On Vivek. Decem- this Nettie, is this I, is awkward for you because you me, did. Dis- I've got the tax returns in front no, of my face. No, it's not awkward for you. Yes, oh, on we'll, December thirty we'll first, when the application for the scholarship was that October. Mehdi, you're wasting your time on childish details in go October of that year when I applied for that scholarship. And it was, well, guess what? The bonuses that a hedge fund pays, and it's, it's a shame that, again, you, yeah. you don't have to be an expert on this, but if you're going to spout out, you better know something yeah. about it. People yeah. pay at a hedge fund the bonuses at the end yes. of a year. And on yes. December 31st, that's when I was paid. I applied for the scholarship that September, and I did not grow up in a wealthy year, family. Vivek, you made more money the previous year. I you made two hundred thousand right? dollars pre-tax or whatever it was. No, you didn't. And, and no, you, you know didn't. what? And, I no, believe. Hold on, hold on. No, you didn't. You're, you're now selling flat. In two thousand nine, you, you have my tax six... returns in front of you. I, I don't do. remember what I made in two thousand. In two thousand nine, you made six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. In two thousand ten, you made less, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So the pre- argument that you only made the money pre-tax. pre the scholarship, <laughs> pre the. Sc- oh, so now we're bringing tax into. We've been using gross Medi, numbers. Medi, yeah, absolutely. Vivek, How you're much? Wrong on this. Go back fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand dollars obviously makes a big. Difference. And then you accepted a Soros scholarship for fifty thousand dollars when you didn't need it. Well, you know what the fact is, Mehdi, is fifty thousand dollars did make a big difference to me back then. And anybody who has a few hundred thousand dollars in the bank is going to take fifty thousand dollars without strings attached. Take the scholarship. But my question for you is, why on earth are you, as an intelligent person interested in politics, obsessing over a twenty-four year old fifty thousand oh, dollars scholarship? I'm interested it would in seeing beneath you. I'm, it's it's, we have, of, we it's have what a country it's on your cap to fix. that you wear. And, I, I'm interested in truth. And, and Mehdi, like that's why I released 20 years. Mehdi, that is why I released 20 years of tax and records. Tell your friends you in the Biden them. administration to do the same thing. Tell okay, your Democrat candidates to, gone, to do the same thing. Well, we've gone We're over time. We're precedents. And I think it you. is pathetic. I just okay. think it is sad and pathetic that you're going that we have important issues to talk about for the future of a country. Yeah. And you're talking about a $50,000 well, scholarship let's talk, let's in 2010 to go to Yale Law School when I was 24. This is pathetic. And this is why nobody trusts you guys. It is pathetic in your view. But, you know, you paid a Wikipedia editor who then removed it. So clearly it's something you didn't want people to read about. Last question, because we've gone over time. Who also, who also what, said worries, I was born in India, who also what, said I was worries, born in India and misspelled and got my wife's name wrong. So, yes, okay, maybe you we should, actually maybe you should need to correct facts when what, people are playing okay, this last game. Last question. You want, you want me to ask a substantive question? Here's what I worry about most. Democracy in this country. I would love Not just questions. under Donald Trump. Yeah. Last question for you. Not just under Donald Trump, but under you, people are worried about authoritarianism. You have preemptively promised to pardon Trump no matter what juries of his peers decide, as well as today extending those pardons to January 6th rioters. You've dismissed white supremacists as boogeymen and unicorns. You want to fire at least half the federal government workforce. That's over a million people. You want to remove the right to vote from 18 to 25 year olds. That's over 30 million people. You want to get rid of birthright citizenship. In fact, you refer to voting and citizenship as privileges when they are, in my view and in the Constitution view, rights. It's a very anti-democratic worldview. What do you say to people who criticize you for that? I don't think it's an anti-democratic worldview. I favor reviving the lifeblood of our constitutional republic. Revive actual free speech and open debate in this country. Revive civic duty in this country, something that our founding fathers envisioned. Revive true equality in front of the law where people aren't prosecuted because of the color of their skin or because of the content of their political views. One standard of the rule of law for everybody. I stand for the founding vision of the country where the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. When, in fact, most policymaking functions in D.C. are performed by federal bureaucrats. So, yes, my standard is would Alexander Hamilton and John James and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, would they be proud of what they see today or would they be appalled? I think if they walked around and saw Washington, D.C. today, they would be appalled 
By the time I leave office in January 2033 after two terms, they will once again be proud of what we've created, a government with three co-equal branches, not four, shutting down that administrative state, reviving civic duty and reviving one standard of the rule of law for all Americans. And that is not a Democratic vision or a Republican vision. That is a pro-American vision that I think can actually reunite this country, which is what I believe I will uniquely be able to deliver as the next president. Vivek Ramaswamy, we will have to leave it there. Appreciate you coming on the show, taking my questions, even if you didn't like all of them. Appreciate you taking time out from a busy campaign. Thank you. Look forward to discussing more of the agenda in the future. Next time, definitely.